There used to be a brick building about 20 yards south of 100 McCall, connected to and identical to one once occupied by above ground art supplies, except it was the mirror image of the latter. You could say it was half a duplex. Behind the building, whose address was 76 McCall, was a dusty, unpaved parking lot presided over by a tanned, stalwart old man with a wide brim straw hat and a big stick, and who looked a lot like Pablo Picasso. His job was to chase away anyone who tried to park there without an up-to-date Ontario College of Art sticker on their windshield, which he did with much ferocity. <laughs> The ground floor of 76 McCall was occupied by an OCA-supported art gallery. But if you entered by an alternate door and climbed a rickety staircase to the second floor, you'd come to a small room, about 20 feet by 20 feet, with the windows overlooking McCall. On a table, you would see a single computer. Such was the original home of the Photoelectric Arts Department, later called New Media, now called Integrated Media. The chair of this department was Richard Hill, who came from an advertising background. His research led him to become heavily influenced by culture guru Marshall McLuhan, who gathered people like Richard around him in weekly meetings and in coach house tucked away in a back alley of the University of Toronto. The story goes that Professor Hill convinced then president of OCA, Roy Ascot, that the college desperately needed a department that focused on the impact of three technologies that were evolving rapidly, namely the telephone, television, and the digital computer. It was Professor Hill's contention that these technologies were in the process of merging and that the merger's inevitable clash with human culture would be immense, possibly catastrophic. Richard Hill's ideas were greeted with intense skepticism among the eight other departments of OCA. It didn't help that he would rave to anyone who would listen about his vision coming across as a self-righteous messiah. He is totally nuts, other chairs of OCA would mutter. And when Professor Hill put a requisition in for a computer, he reacted vehemently, insisting computers have no place in an art college. <laughs> Incoming students tended not to be so resistant. Enrollment in the photoelectric arts department was small at first, attracting about 20 students a year. But its smallness encouraged a strong sense of belonging. Richard Hill's words made sense to them. It helped that the program was not merely about learning how to program a computer or how to design and build electronic circuits, but also, and more importantly, about probing and critiquing digital technology's ongoing impact on the many different aspects of human culture. I joined the Electrics Arts program in 1978. Originally a painter, I had been bitten by the electronic bug 10 years earlier and had built a number of kinetic artworks whose unpredictable behavior derived from digital circuitry and microcomputer programs. On seeing my resume, Professor Hill hired me without hesitation. And so it came to be that I started passing on my self-taught understanding of electronics to a handful of OCA students in the little room on the second floor of 76 McCall. It may well have been the first time electronics was taught as part of a formal college course 
anywhere in the world. Fast forward to 1983. Computers are now appearing throughout the college in text studies where it says a computer helps to generate electronic music. And in the weaving workshop, a, predict, a computer predicts the pattern that a, partic a particular configuration of warps and wefts will generate. 76 Mill Hall is long gone, and the building having been condemned and leveled. And the photoelectrics art department now occupies two floors of the Stewart building at 149 College Street. A few former students have become instructors or administrators. Yal Babor, Carl Hamfeld, and Doug Back, to name three. In a tiny room on the third floor sits an Amiga 500 personal computer capable of generating high resolution graphics. Upstairs, half a dozen Apple computers occupy stalls in a long, narrow room adjacent to the increasingly infamous room 415 where one whole wall is a blackboard covered with scribbles of electronic circuits and programming flowcharts. The Apple IIs have poorer graphics in the Omega, but are easier to connect to sensors, motors, and lights, allowing for a broad range of artistic installations. Soon, IBM PC clones will be arriving, along with the internet. Fast forward again to the present. I don't need to remind you that these days people are walking around clutching computers disguised as cell phones, which feature a graphic and communications capability that could only been, have been seen as a pipe dream 50 years ago. At OCAD University, the probing of their cultural impact continues at an ever more urgent pace. And Richard Hill's crazy philosophies, for better or for worse, have become a reality. If there's a lesson to be learned from all of this, it's perhaps that you should not become discouraged if your fledgling startup is housed in a small room in a crumbling old brick building with a dusty parking lot out back. If the ideas you and your collaborators have brought together in that room are original, well thought out, and vigorously and patiently pursued, chances are you've got it made. As for me, there were many days during my 38 years of teaching when surrounded by some of the most joyfully creative people of my time, I would marvel to myself, wow, I actually get paid for this? <laughs> And now, on top of all that good fortune, here comes an honorary degree. Will wonders ever cease? Thank you, O'Ked. Thank you very much. <laughs>